All right, uh, so I'm gonna talk about social media strategy. Um, how to specifically build a social media strategy, then how to execute on it, uh, like all the way down to like how to write a tweet. Um, and then also, and more importantly, what not to tweet, because uh, that's far more important when you're dealing with a brand than what you're actually putting out there. Uh, a couple things, I'm not an expert in social media. Anybody that tells you they're an expert in social media, run, because no one can be. It's super fluid, it's always changing. With the Instagram, if any of you are into social and you've been paying attention, the Instagram timeline is changing to algorithmic in like the last two days, so that kind of changes the entire game. Uh, today, Twitter released accessibility for photos, meaning you can actually caption a photo uh, so that people that are, are blind can understand what the actual picture is, uh, which is super cool. Twitter kind of going the other way from Instagram, which is awesome. I, Twitter is my jam. I'm gonna talk about Twitter a lot. If you don't like Twitter, sorry. Uh, all right, so I work at the DMZ. Uh, I will talk about the DMZ. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into social and why I'm up here speaking, because otherwise that would be weird if I was just like, yeah, I know some stuff. Uh, so I have a history degree, which makes complete sense. Um, <laughs> shout out to all the undergrads. Uh, okay, so I have a history degree. I moved to Japan when I graduated, and I taught high school English there for four years. Uh, it's okay, you can come in. I'm not gonna bite. He's so afraid, okay. Uh, okay, now they're running away. <laughs> Damn, that's on tape now. Uh, <laughs> So I moved to Japan, I taught high school English for four years. Uh, I came back in August of 2010, uh, and I lived in, in Fukushima, which at the, in August of 2010, nobody knew what Fukushima was. Now, every, most people do. If you don't, it's where the earthquake and the nuclear disaster happened. Um, so I mean, while I was abroad, I kind of you know, played with social media and stuff like that. I was on Facebook a lot. A lot of expat kind of teachers have quite a bit of time. <laughs> in between classes and stuff. So I spent a lot of time on Facebook. I built a couple communities through forums for, for foreigners there and did like video, you know, YouTube's YouTube channel of what I was doing, things like that, which I was just kind of doing for fun. So when I came back, I didn't want to teach because I saw the kids in Canada and they're freaky compared to Japanese kids. Uh, so I started like blogging and I was just randomly freelance writing and then I realized there's no money in that. Uh, and around March of 2011, the earthquake happened in Japan. Uh, so I started to reach out to journalists on Twitter, which I had been kind of using off and on, uh, to find out what was going on on the ground. Because the, the Western media, the stuff that they were putting out was insanity, and you don't study nuclear Japanese when you live in Japan. You're not like, oh yeah, just in case there's a nuclear meltdown, I should probably know all these things. Gee, money. Hi, I'm talking about Fuku right now. Gemma lived in Fuku. Uh, okay, so I started communicating with journalists on the ground uh, in, in Fukushima. It's weird to talk about it now that you're here. Uh, <laughs> Gemma also lived in Fukushima. Uh, so I started to talk to journalists on the ground um, and kind of relay that stuff onto Facebook because foreigners were watching the Western media. They were freaking out because it was like, everyone is dying. Um, so I was putting that on Facebook quite a bit, and then I started to push it to like a blog, and then it started to kind of get picked up, and like MSNBC was calling me every day, being like, all right, this is what we're gonna go with on the news, and I was like, this is insanity, because nobody really knew like Fukushima that was living in Canada at the time, or even North America for the most part. Anyway, a, a journalist from Tokyo reached out to me, he was like, I'm writing this crowdsourced book on different stories from the earthquake. So I wrote a little piece about how I was using social media to keep in touch with the people in Fukushima. Uh, and then I, he, he liked it, so he put it in the book. And then Yoko Ono wrote for it, and then William Gibson wrote for it. And we were like, all right, how do we take this book and turn it into money that we can like donate? Uh, and eventually we, we kind of formed this international team that was pushing this book all over the show. Uh, Amazon picked it up, they ended up publishing it for free, and all the proceeds went to the Japanese Red Cross. Uh, then the Japanese government sent me back to Japan to do blogging and PR and stuff like that. The exact same time as that, a buddy of mine opened a bar. 
which makes no sense. Uh, and I was like, hey, what are, you doing? what are you doing on the internet with your bar? And he was like, what do you, what do you mean on the, on the internet with my bar? I'm going to open the doors. Everybody's going to just flood in. It's going to be cool. Uh, and I was like, no, you should, you should probably have a website and social and stuff like that. So I kind of taught myself through Googling things how to build a website and then marketing tactics and then how to build a community online. Uh, and then he started to make money from that. And I was like, about six months in, I was like, I could, I could probably charge people to, to do this for them because they seem to be really bad at it. What I thought was common sense apparently isn't. So then I started my own business because nobody was hiring anybody for social media that had only six months of experience in 2012. Uh, so I did that because it was easier to talk people into paying me money than it was to talk an HR person into hiring me. You're going to find out more about that as I keep speaking. Uh, <laughs> so through my own company, uh, I have dealt with, that was a really long-winded way so people could show up. Uh, through my own company, I've dealt with tech startups, not-for-profits, uh, geez, restaurants. I did a financial advisor, um, which is really boring. Uh, don't do that. OK. Um, I did the Toronto International Tattoo Convention. I did about five or six different tattoo studios. I did the Socialite Conference, which is uh, for social entrepreneurs. Um, what, what else? Uh, a, bu a bunch of things. So I've basically, like, oh, and my most recent client, because I still maintain my agency right now, even though I work full time at the DMZ, which I'll talk about. Uh, my most recent client was Navdeep Baines, who's the Minister of Economic Development. I wrote his social media strategy for the election. Doesn't that make me sound legit now? You're like, oh, wow, OK. Uh, he wasn't the minister at the time. He was just like a guy who had been an MP and we met in a milestones. But now it sounds super cool when I get to say he's the minister. Uh, so I did that. Um, about a year and a half ago, I started at the DMZ. Uh, if you don't know what the DMZ is, I have slides for it. Uh, so the DMZ is a tech incubator. We're like literally across the street at Young and Dundas. Um, it is the Ryerson DMZ. We're funded by Ryerson, but we're not only for Ryerson students. We're open to the general public. Uh, we are, we were currently ranked number, or just recently ranked number one in North America and number three in the world uh, in the University Business Incubator uh, Index. We look for cool startups, uh, tech startups specifically. So if you have a cool tech startup, with a business plan and a minimum viable product or a prototype, check it out. It's, we're not cohort based. We don't take any equity. Uh, you can apply any time. You get in, you get four months in the space for free. We do workshops, peer to peers. I work there. Uh, so you can, uh, that, that's what the DMZ is. My job there is the, I'm the, the social media strategist, marketer. I hate my title is marketer, but I don't like using marketer. Uh, so I run the DMZ social media as well as advise the 70 some odd startups that we have in the space on their social media strategy, which generally consists of me walking through these slides and yelling at them. Cool. Uh, these are the, these are the things. So, oh, if you're going to take copious notes, I, I do, you can download these slides. I have a, I have a link at the end that you can just grab them. Uh, so we're going to, what is social media? Hopefully, I don't have to really talk you into this. I'm used to just talking clients into it, where they're like, I don't know why I need to be using the internet. Uh, and I'm like, well, and then they're like, I don't know why I need to pay you for that either. So here are all the reasons why, right? You can connect and engage with anybody through social. And that's what social is, right? Everything now is social. Even if you have a website and it's static, it can be shared on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google+, if you're going that way. Uh, <laughs> And, and then it becomes social. The, a conversation can occur just around that link, right? And social, it doesn't matter if you're B2B or B2C or any of that stuff. Everything is P2P because that's really what social is. It's the social interactions that we're having, but you have them online. It's person to person. So using social, I mean, I'm going to focus a lot on relationship building and perception of your brand. Right? Like the, these are the two things that you can do through social that you can't do at any other 
level, right? I mean, you can talk to everybody in this room, but if you hop on Twitter right now, you can talk to 350 million different people, right? And that's, Twitter is my jam. I'm gonna talk about Twitter a lot uh, because you can talk to 350 million people there. Uh, depending on what you're looking to do, you can achieve all of those goals by starting a relationship online, then taking it offline. Uh, social levels of playing field. It doesn't, if you're starting a shoe company and you want to go up against Converse and Nike, you have the same tools available to you through social that Nike does to it, other than like they get to throw money. This is me throwing money uh, behind anything that they're doing. So like they can boost their audience, but social rewards good content, right? The stuff that you see on Facebook, you probably are seeing it because it's been engaged with a lot. If your content is good, you win. Uh, or like kind of win or maybe win. Uh, but that's really what, it, what social comes down to when you're sharing is providing value, right? Uh, brand evangelist identification and creation. So you, you can find people that will spread your message because it's better to have me talk about your brand than you, the brand, talk about your brand because nobody's going to believe you. People are going to believe me because I'm a person and they've probably met me before or maybe they haven't, but they follow me on Twitter. Right? But that's legit. It's, 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 authentic. it's authentic. Uh, co promotion and SEO. You can get retweets. You can get other Facebook pages to share your stuff. Um, oh, brand legitimacy. Startups. All right, I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to go and look at your social media profiles. Most VCs do. I mean, some don't. But if you're looking for some kind of investment or to show that you're actually engaged in your company on a day to day basis, the easiest way to do that is to post something on social that provides value, right? Like, if, if I go and look at your Twitter account and you haven't tweeted since 2013 for your brand, what does that tell me about your company? What's the perception of that? It's that you're not paying attention or you don't care, right? Uh, and free, with a little, with a little star, because it's, it's time consuming and time is money, or you hire me and I'm not free. Uh, sorry, that was weird. Um, all right, so why not use social media? Uh, because it requires strategy, but I'm gonna walk you through that, so you'll be totally sorted by the time you leave here. Uh, it's time consuming because you can literally spend all day staring at stuff online, trying to, and you can get lost. So I, I will walk through how to kind of do that too, but there are days that hit where I come in and I'm like, no meetings, I'm gonna do so much work today. And then somebody sends a tweet and I spend the next three hours just dealing with it. Um, constant learning and monitoring, I kind of talked about this already. You know, Instagram's algorithmic timeline is coming and Snapchat just changed a bunch of stuff today. Uh, like everything is always changing. And if you're not on top of that and you're dealing with like the old version of whatever it is, or you're under the, the, the mindset that, like when Facebook switched from image, ba they, they put more weight, they used to put more weight towards images, right? You share a meme, it showed to everybody, everybody likes it, yay. Then they realized after t over time that like news and legitimate news links were actually what people were clicking on more and engaging with more. So they gave more weight to news links and less weight to photos, but if you're not paying attention to that and you're just still sharing photos from your brand page on a regular basis, like in hopes that you're going to get more engagement, you, you won't. Uh, so that's the, the constant learning and monitoring. And the internet is harsh. Trolls are everywhere. Don't feed them. Uh, someone will inevitably hate on you. Uh, and just always take the high road, always be positive. And if they go absolutely insane on you, then just don't respond. Those people aren't worth it. So before I get into social media strategy, what's paramount to all of this stuff? It's cool, you can come in, bro. No, this isn't the right place for you? Okay, cool. Damn, you're recording, I keep forgetting. There were people over there. Uh, <laughs> the last time they recorded this, I was talking to randos and then I watched it afterwards and went, they don't know who I'm talking to. I'm gonna talk to the camera sometimes. Uh, all right, your website. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be that kind of talk. Uh, your website is absolutely like paramount, right? It is where people go to drink your Kool-Aid. I don't care what you're doing. 
That's where people are going to become brand evangelists. That's where they're going to learn more about your company. I'm not going to tweet out like, this is the greatest company ever if I've never looked at your website or if I haven't learned something from it. And you have to allow people to dive deep if they want to, right? Have an about that is short at the top and then longer so that if I'm really crazy about your company, I want to learn every single thing that you've ever done, I can find out. And it's the hub. This is where everybody's going to drive back to, right? On every single social media platform you have, you're going to link to your site. And hopefully your site links to every social media platform you have. If it doesn't, go change that, uh, right? Th this is what you're doing with your social. It doesn't matter if you're using secondary content, meaning like you link to a Mashable article that's cool. Your Twitter bio, your Facebook page, they all have your website on them. And if I like the article that you put out for Mashable, and I'm like, wow, these guys really know what they're doing and they're putting out compelling content. I'm probably gonna click on your website and check out who you are. And then if you have three lines and it's a terrible experience for me, I hate you immediately and then I never go back there again, right? People are fickle. There are so many websites out there. Don't make yours the bad one. It's not about like it being the best web experience ever. It's just about not being the worst experience ever. So with that said, here's a website audit checklist. Uh, I have a bunch of startups on a regular basis tell me like, when you Google our name, we come up first. I mean, they don't always say it in that voice, but sometimes they do. Uh, and then I'm like, have you searched it in an incognito window? And there are a bunch of SEO tactics that you can show up for whatever you want to show up for, right? If I'm searching for a restaurant in Toronto, you can, there, there are other tactics. But really, you want to come up first for your own name because that comes down to brand perception. If, I go, if you tell me you work for like this business and then I Google it and you come up fourth, what's my perception of that brand? It's like, oh, these guys don't even come up first for their name? Uh, so search an incognito window because the incognito window, if you're using Chrome, I hope you're all using Chrome. Everybody's a regular person in here that's using Chrome and not Internet Explorer, right? Cool, I'm not even asking, that's rhetorical, you should be. Uh, Open an incognito window and Google search your, your company. That's where you actually rank. Startups would tell me like, yeah, we rank first for our name. A and then I incognito window it and they come up like sixth. And I'm like, so no you don't. Google actually tracks what it is you go to on a regular basis and then shares that to you. That's why they're Google. That's why they win the internets because they're showing you the content that you want to see, right? So if you go to, if your browsing habits are ridiculous, then it's going to show you more ridiculous stuff. Just don't Google in front of your mom. What's up? Yes, you should 100% do that because you don't want to have to compete with somebody that's already crushing it, right? Uh, one of my, my, my restaurant client that my buddy started, they picked the name Baker Street Station, which is a terrible name because Baker Street Station is the oldest London underground station and it's where Sherlock Holmes lives, and all of those things, which is terrible. Uh, but if you search Baker Street Station anywhere outside of the UK right now, I am one to eight, because I win the internets. What up now? Uh, so, um, but you should. Like when they tried to name it that, I was like, no, this is the most terrible name. Do not pick this name. And they were like, we don't care about the internets, Brent. And they just went with it anyway, and I had to figure out ways to actually do this. Yeah, if you right click on Chrome, like on the Chrome icon, it says open in an incognito window. It's basically like a fresh search, right? So if you're like searching weird things, incognito window, so that it doesn't go into your search history, right? <laughs> There's a pro tip. Uh, all right, site description. This is the next thing. This is the line that comes up underneath your URL. You guys are having a good time, eh? I like it, cool. Uh, this is the, the the sentence that comes up underneath your URL when I'm looking on Google. It's 157 characters. That's what you get, 157 characters. Now, you should keep it to 150 because that is the max description for an Instagram account. But why would I do that, Brent? Because you want to have the same description everywhere, right? Because then Google will index all of your things and go, oh, this is their Instagram account. This is their Twitter account. This is. So what it should do is hit keywords but not sound spammy. Right, so the DMZs is something along the line, and I always get this wrong even though I helped write it, which is terrible, and I've given this presentation a bunch of times. 
Uh, it's like Canada's number one uh, business incubator, helping tech startups win since, or helping tech startups worldwide, uh, or something like that, and then helping entrepreneurs win since 2010. It definitely doesn't have helping twice, because that would be terrible. Uh, but having, so I have about six or seven keywords in there, startups, Canada, entrepreneurs, all of those things that I'm trying to come up for in Google searches. Responsive design, it works on your phone. Does it work on your phone? Cool, you're good, party on. Does it not work on your phone? Is it weird? Everybody's hit a site at some point where you have to like scroll in and you're like, what the? And you're trying to like click the drop downs and they don't like show up and they're weird. That's not responsive. And Google actually came out in May of 2015 and now they penalize you if your site isn't responsive. So instead of you showing up seventh, now you show up on the seventh page, which is just the best, right? That's where you want to be. That's where people get to in a Google search. Uh, so have responsive design. Social media icons, super important. I get to your website, where do you exist? Where can I engage with your brand on a regular basis? If you don't have social media icons, how do I know? There is no way in hell I am opening a new tab, going to Facebook, and then searching your business name so that I can see if you have a Facebook page. There is no way. You get two clicks out of anybody, right? Three if you're lucky, but two and then you're dead. So think about how many clicks and then I have to type too? Gross, not doing that. Uh, so make sure all of your social media icons exist on your site. Also, it helps with SEO because you're doing link backs, positive link backs from legitimate places like Facebook. Under Wikipedia, Facebook is like the whole, well, Wikipedia is like the holy grail of link backs because they're a legit source and it's really hard to get a Wikipedia page if you've ever tried. It's ridiculous. There are like actual firms that just do like, we'll get you a Wikipedia page, which is legit. Pay them if you want it because I have no idea how. Uh, where was I? I just went off on a random Wikipedia rant. Okay, so social media icons have them. Make your navigation easy uh, so that I can figure out where I'm going. URL discrepancies. This is when you have the about page and then the title of it says team. So your H1 tags and the, and the slug are after like yourdomain.com slash about and then you call it team. Google indexes that and goes, oh, these people don't know how to build websites. Cool. We'll put them on the seventh page. Uh, super easy, super important. Um, links off site. When I click your Facebook link because you're smart enough to have a social media icon, does it open in a new tab or does it open in the same tab? You definitely want it to open in a new tab because you want to keep me on your website so that I drink your Kool-Aid, right? If it opens, your Facebook page opens in the same tab and I'm looking at your Facebook page and I'm like, oh cool, you haven't posted since September 2013, wicked. Then I just hit the Facebook button. I'm not hitting back to go to your website. Even if your content is okay and I just decide, nah, I'm not gonna like this page. I'm still gonna hit Facebook, the Facebook button because that's what everybody does. You're just automatically drawn to be like, well, what else is on Facebook now? And then I'm like, wow, look, Julie had a great weekend. I'm liking it and commenting on it. And then I don't even that you exist anymore. Uh, I mean, maybe I do, but probably not. Um, optimize image titles for search. Nobody does this. I don't understand why. When you upload a photo to your website and it is titled DSC underscore 2479821, why? Why? Because you're lazy? Mm hmm. Because you're lazy. Don't be lazy. Uh, <laughs> Right, you can actually use these image, like your images, you can put in a bunch of keywords, and I'm not saying go insanity and like make them gigantic, but have a couple. The other day I was looking for, one of my restaurants, I was looking for a, a, a picture of a steam whistle tall boy, because they had a special. Uh, so then I'm searching for it, and the thing that comes up fourth is an image for one of my restaurant clients that doesn't even have a picture of a steam whistle tall boy in it. They have a special, for Steam Whistle Tall Boys, but I had a picture of a Wellington for, uh, tall boy in there. Well, that stands out from everything else that's in that photo range. You can Google it sometime if you want. And maybe, just maybe, I mean, this is an off chance, but somebody's like, what is this? And they click it, 
And then all of a sudden they're like, view the, view the image on a page. Now you're on my website. You're drinking my Kool-Aid, giving me the monies, right? I mean, and that's a very off chance, but why risk it? Why not show up in images that you want to show up for? People do image searches all the time. Social sharing. Uh, I'm going to talk about why you need to have a blog. That's in a little bit. But if you do have a blog, make it easy for me to share it. You don't want to like you don't want to have social sharing icons on your home page because no one's ever sharing your home page. It's never going to happen. This is a wicked website. That's never happening. But people will share your blog posts if they find them valuable or thought provoking or they want to identify with them and I'll talk about why you should why people share in a bit. But if I can't, again, it comes down to two clicks. So say I see you tweet something out, and I'm like, cool, and I click it. There's one, and I'm on, I'm on your blog post, and I read it, and I'm like, wow, this is the greatest blog post I've ever read in my entire life. And you don't have any social sharing icons? Now I have to copy the URL, open a new tab, go to Twitter, put in the URL, write the title, and then put in like a compelling thought on top of that? No. I mean, like I do it, but that's because my, my job is the social medias. Uh, but like for the average user, that's, that's not going to happen. So having the ability for me to, at the bottom of your page, click the Twitter button, and then it auto-populates with the title, and then the URL, and then it says via at your username, that's the best. Because like, what happens if you bring in somebody, they have 150,000 super engaged followers, they read your thing and they're like, oh, they don't have the social share button? Or they go to tweet it out and it doesn't bring up your brand? How are you going to know? I mean, I'll talk about how you're going to know. But uh, and it, if it doesn't tag you, then you don't, you don't know that that ever existed, right? So definitely have social sharing on there and have it bring up your brand as much as you possibly can so that you win. Speaking of social sharing, Twitter cards and open graph. Uh, open, I'm going to talk about open graph first. I should really flip those two. Um, you know when you're on Facebook and you see like a Mashable article and it has the full image at the top and then the, the actual like headline and then the lead and all of that? That's open graph. You can control what shows up when somebody shares your stuff on social. Open graph is for LinkedIn, Facebook, Pinterest, all of those other than Twitter. Twitter has its own thing, it's Twitter cards. Right? So you can show, you can pick what shows up there. So every image, like the image that you have on your blog should be 1200 by 628. That's the, that's the image size for a Facebook uh, image share. Uh, so having that, super important, right? Because if I go to share your stuff, if you've ever shared anything that like an image didn't show up or the URL comes up and it's like general underscore news dash a bunch of numbers and stuff. Now, when, even if you do share it and you're like, this is the greatest article ever, it goes out to all of your friends on Facebook and they just see like general underscore news. When's the last time you clicked a link that looked like that? Ever? Maybe? Like maybe you did if it was like your best friend and they like tagged you in it and they were like, you have to read this thing. But then even then you're like, eh, this looks spammy, right? So controlling the actual perception of like your brand and your blog on, on the internet is super important. Because then I can even say like, this is the worst thing I've ever read, but you st that's only a line on Facebook. And then you get the rest to convince somebody why they should click it. I mean, if I say this is the worst thing I've ever read, people are probably going to click it because uh, they want to read it too. But like, you know what I mean. Um, Twitter cards are the, oh, it, Open Graph is it's OGP.org, I think, something like that. It's the Open Graph protocol. It's one line of code that you put in the head of your site uh, just to set it up. And you can set it up for every single page so that the same image goes out. If you're using a CMS, some, like uh, WordPress, it's just a plugin. There's a plugin called, oh, you did come. What up, homie? Hi. Are you, are you good? Yeah, you're good? OK. Um, this is mine. Uh, it's only the people that I know that come to see me talk. Uh, <laughs> okay, where was I? Uh, Twitter card. Twitter cards and Open Graph. Oh, Open Graph is one line of code. Uh, CMS. If you're using like WordPress or stuff like that, there's a plugin. Uh, the DMZ uses Yoast SEO. 
which just allows you, it's a little tiny thing at the bottom of WordPress that's like, hey, what image do you want to show up? What lead do you want to show up? Boom, finished, totally sorted, super easy. It even has a thing that you just click and it's Twitter card, like, it's like, turn Twitter cards on and you just click it and then, and then you're done. Uh, so like super simple, but so many people don't do it. Twitter cards are open graph for Twitter. Again, it's like one line of code that you put on your site. Right? You want to test this out, take a link that you have on your website, throw it into Facebook, post it, see what it looks like. Because that's what everybody else sees. And if it looks gross, fix it. Um, design and layout, just, just make it look OK. Uh, design and layout and copy, don't ask your mom. Don't ask your mom, don't ask your friends, don't ask your wife, your significant other, none of those things. Ask my mom. My mom has no idea who you are, and she does not care. Uh, ask somebody that's going to actually tell you something. Don't ask your friends. They're all going to be like, yeah, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, great. No, it probably isn't. I mean, maybe it is. I'm sorry. I just think you're all the worst automatically, so that I'm just trying to build you all up together. If you're already good at all these things, I apologize. Oh, that being said, really quick, the DMZ website is not responsive. I'm not responsible for that. Just in case you look at it and you're like, Brent, Brent, uh, d d he hasn't fixed that. You got a question? No, I actually thought uh, the, web the DMZ website uh, yeah. was fixed. So yeah. What happened was the website was used up to like some ambiguous fashion, let's say. Oh, good. Yeah, I did it twice. So I went around Sweet. showing the, like the event posting. I was like, hey, look, the website's missing. Yeah, yeah. Our website is janky and it's terrible. We're fixing it. We're fixing it. I swear to God, I've been like pushing for like a year to just, just fix it. I'm like, fix it, please. All right, so, but every other website that I've built does these things, I swear. Uh, <laughs> All right, social media strategy creation. This is a social media strategy. Uh, obviously, this isn't it. Um, generally, when I write one of these, they're about like 35 pages long. Uh, we're not going to go through all of these because that's ridiculous. I'm going to give you the bare bones of like what you actually need to execute, okay? So you can hammer through all of these things if you want. You don't, you don't really have to, have to. What you really have to focus on is goals, target segments, and content themes. Those are the three major things that you need for any social media strategy, and everything else is kind of like secondary, right? A response strategy or a competitive analysis or monitoring and everything like that uh, you can do if you have the time to do it. Uh, but from a startup entrepreneurial perspective, you probably barely have time to do this. Uh, so strategy goals, here's an example. Um, and these are, uh, don't worry, you'll be like, the, obviously I know the goals and the, and the target segments. I'll get there, trust. Uh, this is an example, right? Attract, are you trying to attract users and clients? Are you trying to position your company as the go-to for X? Number six should be on every single social media strategy anybody ever writes, right? Become a thought leader in a target vertical or market. Like, take target vertical or ma and market or market out of there and then put in wherever you exist. Fashion, right? Uh, because that's really what you're trying to do through social is you're trying to become that valuable, authentic, legitimate voice in your industry. You want to become known as the best, right? Um, and with all these other things, you can throw them in there. So like the DMZs, uh, our goals are to attract startups, promote the current startups in the space, and become a thought leader in the startup and startup ecosystem in Toronto, Canada, and the world. Right? That's what I'm trying to do 100% of the time. Target segments, these are the people you're go actually going after. Right? Super easy to break down. I mean, when I was doing like NavDeep Bain social media strategy, it was like, very specific because we had like demographics of the people in his riding and everything and you're just like okay we're going to target all these different people because they're all into different things uh, the dmz's it's super simple we have like startups and entrepreneurs companies that want to partner or become clients of or acquire or have something to do with either the dmz or startups and then evangelists or anybody anybody that can help us spread our brand awareness right so that's influencers that's just any, anybody you can think of, journalists, all of those things. Content themes. This is the, the crux of any social media strategy. This is what you need to come up with 
and this is the stuff that you're sharing on a regular basis. Okay, so like a lot of this stuff is relatively easy. So there's primary and secondary content themes. Primary being stuff you create yourself, secondary being stuff you find that you can share that will add value, right? And that could be a Mashable article. It could be any of those things. Um, so what you want to come up with, though, is at least 10 things that you're going to share on a regular basis. So if you're a tech startup, maybe you want to talk about community news like iOS meetups or 3D print, printing tech, uh, you know, tips, tricks, life hacks that, that are in ge just general interest into the tech space. Um, trans oh, transparency and startup life are the best. All right, if you're a startup, especially, and even for big brands, share, like sharing your personal story and pushing it into the startup story makes a ton of sense because people don't want to identify with a brand, they want to identify with a person. So if you're a co-founder, pushing out on a, an image of yourself and your team or whatever, or you're out somewhere or you're doing something that relates to your startup, like don't, don't like drunken tweet selfies or something, like don't do that, that's not, that's not transparency. But if you're doing things that directly impact your business and you can mention it, I mean, even right, like, I'm not saying you have to tweet right now or anything, but like learning some social media tips right now and then tweeting it out and a picture, you probably don't take a picture of me, take a picture of the slides, do that, uh, right? Even that shows that you're like committed to the startup, right? You're committed to startup life. And you can show personality through that. Even if you're doing ridiculous things, you're having a Nerf gun fight or something, like fine. Instagram that because it's still building that like brand that you're trying to push out there, right? It can help you build brand awareness because people are going to be like, wow, this startup is fun or this company is fun and I like them and I identify with, the, with, with what they're talking about. Um, other stuff like news updates, blogs, the things that you create yourself. Really when, you, when you're thinking about your, your content themes, think about it like a Venn diagram. There are three circles. So if you're a tech startup, you're probably going to talk about tech, you're going to talk about startup life, and maybe you're going to talk about something hyper-local like your area or being in Toronto or something like that. But right in the center of those is that unique value proposition that you have, that your company has, that you're going to share on a regular basis. So I'll give you a couple examples. Well, I'll give you one example because if I do a couple, it'll take way too long. Uh, there's a company called CrowdBabble at the DMZ. They do social media analytics. They have a really robust and awesome platform. Not that I'm plugging them. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> but I like them. They're cool. Uh, so I met with them when they first came into the DMZ, and they showed me, like, you can compare your Instagram account to any other Instagram account out there. And it breaks down how many hashtags you're using versus the other person. It breaks down engagement. It breaks down everything. It's crazy, the amount of stuff you can see. So I said to them, I was like, well, you guys should be sharing Nike versus Reebok or any major, Ryerson versus U of T, like whatever you want to do, right? But that is of interest to their target segment, me. Because I want to see that. I want to see who's outranking who. And that achieves their goal of getting users, right? Like they want me to pay them money. That's definitely going to be the number one goal for a social media analytics platform. Right? This is why you build these three things. Your content theme always relates back to a target segment, and through that target segment, it achieves a goal. Everything that I'm doing from any social media channel that I have, other than my own, because I don't really care at the end of the day when I'm tweeting from my own account, half of these rules I don't stick to for my own social media because I do it all day. Uh, <laughs> But this is what you should be doing. Everything should be strategic. Literally everything. I mean, you don't have to go down to that like finite of a, of a or granular of a space, sorry. Um, but every single person that I follow from the DMZ account is strategic. Every single time I like something, it's strategic. Every time I retweet, every time I reply to something, it's strategic, right? Uh, and everything always relates back. Because if you can't relate back to your end goal, why are you sharing it? 
Like you could take a picture of your coffee on a Sunday morning with your laptop and like putting in work, but like what does that actually do other than yeah, just, just create a wall of photos on Instagram that are everybody doing that? Because everybody's taking that photo, right? From like right above, you're doing this with your like coffee and you're like, yeah, yeah, it's just perfect right now and I'm just gonna, right? Everybody does it. It's legit. I do it. It's fine. But from your brand, where's the strategy behind that? Other than like, I want to be like every other startup that's ever existed. All right, platforms. I'm going to try and roll through these very quickly. Okay. Where to be? Facebook, Google+, Twitter, LinkedIn, blog. And you're like, Brent, why Google+. Shh, I'll get there. Uh, maybe Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, and YouTube. Why do I have maybe there? Because those ones are hard because they're visual. If you don't have a visual brand, like if you're a B2B company, it gets really difficult to have an Instagram. Even with the DMZ account, it gets really hard to push out Instagram content because there are only so many times I can take pictures of like people in a boardroom and then, and then put a tilt shift on it and be like, where to have these people in the space? Like that gets boring, right? So I don't use Instagram as often from the DMZ account as say I do with my restaurant clients because they have visual content. So I can pump stuff out all day. Uh, but that's why the visual ones, you have to be like very aware of what you're going to do and have a strategy behind, all right, what are my content themes just for Instagram alone or just for Pinterest or Snapchat? Snapchat is so hard. You have to make a mini movie every day or every other day, which is ridiculous. Uh, so blog, I've kind of already talked about this. SEO, constant refresh. So like if you're, if you're blogging once every two weeks, Google's indexing new links on your site. They're like, yay, this is constantly being updated. We like that. Plus it's creating primary content for your social media channels for you to pump out there, hope other people share it, and then it goes viral. Nothing's ever gonna go viral, just so you know. Just, just never say it's gonna go viral, and if you do, do this the entire time. Always with the air quotes. Nothing ever goes viral. All right, uh, so positives, all of those things, right? You can do all the things that you want with a blog. Negatives, you have to create them. You have to write a blog. I don't know if you've ever written blogs, but they take a while. Uh, and like maybe you have like three really good ideas right now, and that's great, and you hammer out three blog posts in the next three days, and then all of a sudden you're like, Ugh, I don't want to write any more blog posts, right? It's all about consistency, so figure out a, a rate that you can actually achieve this at. Even if it's once every two months, that's fine. This being said, if you look at my own company's blog, I haven't blogged since 2013. I just yell at other people to do it. Uh, okay, Facebook. Everybody knows Facebook. Here's the thing, 1.5 billion people. Do you wanna sell to 1.5 billion people? Be on Facebook. Do you not want to sell to 1.5 billion people? Cool. But what? <laughs> you have the wrong idea then, right? There are 1.5 billion people on Facebook. Their ad targeting is insanity. Now, what nobody seems to know every time I do this, does everybody know what the Facebook algorithm is? Anybody? Anybody know? Yeah, D Doug does because he's been here before. Uh, round two, buddy. Okay. So. You know you have a, a friend from high school that you totally forgot was alive and then all of a sudden they like get married or have a kid or like graduate or something and their, their content just pops up in your feed and you're just like, what the? I didn't even know I was still friends with this person or that they were alive. That's the Facebook algorithm. So if you don't engage with something, even with your friends, Facebook doesn't show you that friend's posts anymore, right? until it goes super viral, right? When something gets engaged with a lot, then Facebook goes, all right, maybe we should share this to more people because it seems to be something that people are engaging with. And that's why you only see when your friends get married or have a kid or like any of those like major occasions where they get 100 likes on it or something like that and you're like, oh my God, I didn't even know they were alive. Yes? So you think that, that, Instagram is that is exactly what Instagram is doing. Uh, I'm going to rant about Instagram algorithm. If you're on Instagram and you're telling people to turn notifications on, fucking stop. Uh, <laughs> it makes me so angry. People did it when Facebook came out with their algorithm. They were like, make sure you turn on post notifications. Oh, you're filming and I just swore. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> 
So when Facebook came out with their algorithm, and it's going to be the same algorithm because Facebook owns Instagram, all of these pages went out and said, make sure you turn on notifications for our posts. That means that every single time that page posts, my phone buzzes and I get a notification that comes up on my screen, I'm eventually going to unlike your page because you're annoying me. I'm not going to scale it back to like turn post notifications off. You're going to annoy the crap out of me. It's like your friend that won't stop texting you. It's that. But now you're dealing with it from a brand perspective, right? And people are flipping out on Instagram. So here's how you win the Facebook algorithm. Put out good content. Just put out good content. If it's not good, it won't get engaged with. That's probably a good sign. You probably don't want people to see your terrible, terrible post, right? Put out content that appeals to your target demographic. Provide value through the content that you're sharing. And then people will go, yeah, I like this. And they'll like it or they'll share it, right? So the algorithm exists you know, for your friends. But it also exists way more harshly for a Facebook page, right? If you get anywhere above 3 to 5% on your Facebook page of engagement, just impressions alone, that's better than average. So 3 to 5% of however many likes you want. Now, if you have under 500 likes, your impressions are going to go up because Facebook, it's like they're giving you the first one for free kind of thing, right? Because then eventually you start to get engagement and you're like, wow, people really like stuff on Facebook. And then you get up to like 1,000 likes and you're like, why did only 72 people view this post? But now they have you, right? You're just, you've, you've, you've committed. That being said, Facebook is a great place to be. And if you're ever going to run ads, especially with Instagram integration, their Facebook ads are insane. I can target a 17-year-old Swahili-speaking person that lived in Montreal for four years and now lives within two kilometers of right here. Like, that's nuts. I mean, go, if you've never just looked, it's just interesting to see what you can do. Just like go into Ads Manager and like see how specific you can get. It is insanity. But that being said, you can do a ton with that, right? When I'm running Facebook ads, I'll run three different ad sets with three different images because the image on a Facebook ad is super important. Uh, and I'll run all of those and I put like 20, 20 bucks behind them and I run them for two days each and I target different demographics and then I see what over indexes and what under indexes and then that's where I take, I take the analytics from all of that and I'm like, these two posts did the best. And then that's when I hammer money behind them. Right? Make sure that you're like testing. I never talk about Facebook ads, but I am right now. Uh, you don't have to do Facebook ads. You can organically grow through Facebook. Uh, it's super, just use Facebook as a page and then go and like other brand pages and then engage with their content. So like say Globe and Mail puts out a piece on their Facebook page and you jump in from your brand page and you're like, you say something super witty and super compelling that everybody's like, oh my God, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard. And then they see that it came from your brand page and they click it and then they're like, oh, I like this brand page. And then they like your page, boom, you win the internet. Uh, all right, Twitter, Twitter is my jam. I promise, oh, here we go. All right, love Twitter. Okay, you can do anything on Twitter, all right? It's not just like spamming stuff into the ether and the, look at, I'm getting like excited about it and my voice is going up. I apologize, I apologize. Uh, Okay, you can do a anything. I don't care, like there are tons of articles that say like, well, the user adoption is going down. There are 350 million people on Twitter. How many, how many people do you need to, to hit? More than 350 million people? I mean, my idea is that the 350 million people that are on Twitter are the people who, who know how to use the internet. That's it, I mean, for good or for evil. Right, like there are trolls definitely all over Twitter. But you can connect, and if you're a tech startup or somebody that's looking for innovation, Twitter, if, if the person that you're trying to connect with doesn't exist on Twitter, they're probably not into tech or innovation, right? Like, I mean, maybe they aren't, but you could probably find someone else, right? So uh, what, what can you use Twitter for? Everything, BD, marketing, media, 
all of that stuff. I literally did a three hour talk the other day on just how to use BD, or sorry, just how to use Twitter for relationship building in a, in a place. Literally every single person that works for you can do better on, with their job through Twitter. You can create any relationship you want, right? The uh, really quick, I have a bunch of stories about this. Like, one of the startups that I advised signed Tridel through Twitter. Tridel, they make all the condos in the entire city. What you do is you go to Tridel, you find their LinkedIn page, you go through Tridel's, all in Tridel's employees, and then you add them to a private list on Twitter. Private list, nobody knows they've been added to. You don't even have to follow those people. So we, we searched all the names, and we put them into a private list on Twitter. Then we added them into a column on Hootsuite, which you can do for free. You just monitor multiple lists all at the same time. We put them all in one list, and we get engaged with those people. Even like mid-management people, because they're all terrible at Twitter. They have like 40 followers, and they tweet stuff out, and they're like, wow, does nobody like my stuff? And it's all about ego, right? As soon as you start to engage with them, they're like, wow, what's this thing paying attention to me? Oh, it's this brand. And they click on the Twitter account, and then they click on the website, and they're like, wow, these guys do a cool thing. I like that. And you continue to engage with them. It's like dating in the 90s, before Tinder. Uh, like where you can engage with people and slowly build a relationship, right? You like their tweets, you retweet, you reply, you have a conversation. And when you reply, you don't say things like, buy my product, because what? Why are you doing that? You would never do that in real life. So don't do it on the internet, okay? Um, but, and eventually, somebody did reach out, and then they signed them. I was talking to a startup the other day that I cannot name that signed a large military client because their stuff got retweeted by a, a general somewhere. That is literally all I'm, I had to ask him. I was like, can I bring this up? And he was like, no, <laughs> you can say that. So that's all, that, that's all I could say. But it, that's cool, right? Um, even Scott Stratton, who wrote Unmarketing, and I'm gonna talk about him in a little bit. Uh, no, right at the end where I tell you what books you should read. Scott Stratton wrote Unmarketing. He's like one of my social media gods. We had a huge conversation through Twitter about media closures and stuff. He just tweeted something out and I responded to him and we had a conversation where I said none of the words about incubators or startups or anything. We just talked about it. And then at the end, because I was losing my mind, I quote tweeted the first tweet and was like, oh my God, huge fanboy moment. I just talked to Scott Stratton on Twitter. And then he responded with, I'd love to come by and check out the incubator sometime. Uh, okay, Scott Stratton, we can hang out. And then he did for like an hour and a half. We just, I was like, yeah, hey, hey, Scott Stratton. And then, and then we talked about social media for, for, and like speaking, but he speaks to like big, huge groups of people. Uh, and this is the largest room I've ever spoken in. So there's that. We're like the same person. Um, <laughs> right? But like you can literally connect with anybody. You could tweet at Kanye if you want. I mean, he's probably not going to respond, but you can. That's my point with Twitter, with journalists, with everything. You can, here's a really quick Twitter hack. Say you find a news article that's about you or that is of interest to your target segments. Take the URL and search it in Twitter, then click live. It shows you every single person that has shared that article ever. Snap, there you go. So anytime that you're in the, in the news, like your startup's in the news, you can go and engage with every single person that shared that news story through Twitter. Those are your evangelists. Isn't that amazing? Imagine you tweeted an article out about somebody and then they came along and like liked it and then repl replied to it and said like, thanks so much for sharing that. That's huge. Right? And so many people don't do that. It's crazy. And even if, you've, if you're not getting press, you can always tweet that article out and tag the journalist. Tag the journalist. Never tag the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail is never going to re, via Globe and Mail, no. Nah, they're never going to retweet it. They don't care. I mean, they, maybe they do, but probably not. Uh, but the journalist who has 400 followers that has been writing about tech or whatever industry you're in for the last 15 years is probably going to pay more attention to that. And then you form a relationship with that journalist. And then when your startup launches, you reach out and you're like, hey, we just launched. Remember how we're friends? What's up? And then they're like, oh, I'll just write the front page of the Globe and Mail about your startup. Like that's, 
And that's why if you're in stealth mode, stop it. Stop it. If you're in stealth mode with your st stop. Stop. Just st stop. You don't have to tweet about your own product, but like tweet about stuff in your area, like in your area of expertise. This is way longer than I normally talk about Twitter. I'm so riled up though. Uh, just stop, stop doing that. What's going on, dude? Um, so negatives is that it's crowded. What you should do is use private lists. So with the DMZ, I run 22 private lists that nobody even knows they're on. I have a couple public ones too, so that people can go and see like current startups or alumni startups. But I'm running 22. Influencers, community, VCs, investment firms, uh, like venture capitalists. I always say VCs, and then I realize sometimes people don't know what those are. Uh, venture capitalists, people that are gonna, gonna give money away, right? Um, so run a bunch of private lists. Run your competition. I get a notification every time the people that I've deemed to be my competition, which I am not going to name because they're friends of ours anyway from the DMZ perspective, I get a notification every time they tweet just so I know what they're putting out there. I also get a notification every time any employee from the DMZ tweets ever. Uh, and I respond within five minutes. So there's that. Yeah, you have about a 60 minute response time, unless you're like sleeping or on, when I'm speaking. Like clearly I'm not tweeting right now. Uh, but I generally aim for a five minute response time. If you go over 60 minutes, you might be dead to that person. If you wait like four days, you're definitely dead to that person. If you like my tweet from four days ago about your brand, <laughs> I just know that you're really bad at social now. Uh, <laughs> okay, Instagram. <sighs> God damn. Uh, okay, them kids. Them kids are on the Instagrams. Uh, all right, Instagram. Be there if you have visual content. Do not spam hashtags. For the love of God, stop it. Just don't. Don't, don't spam a million hashtags. Just try this. If you're like one of those people that like writes a sentence and then like dogs of Instagram, na na na, and like just a million hashtags underneath or you're like commenting to hide your, your if you're commenting to hide your hashtags, you're, you're not actually hiding them unless you're getting a ton of comments. Instead, what happens is your thing shows up and then your comment shows up right underneath that and that looks spammy and weird, right? And when you spam a bunch of hashtags on the end of your Instagram content, that again, even if you put it all in one block, it looks spammy and weird. Use a couple, for sure. For sure, use a couple, that's fine. But like, tr here's a test. Just like go out, put out the same type of content a week apart on a Wednesday or whatever at whatever time you want, okay? Put out the same type of content, spam all of your ridiculous hashtags, on one, and then put like two on the other one, and then look at the engagement. If you see a gigantic difference, cool. But think about yourselves. Like most people discover on Instagram through their friends or through the Explorer Discovery channel. When's the last time you clicked dogs of Instagram and spent four hours going through every dogs of Instagram photo? Oh, never? Cool. Why would you do it then? It's so crazy to me. Um, really what this comes down to is like, what, what, what do you do on this platform? And if you aren't doing it, then, then, then none of your users are either. Uh, what else do I have to say about Instagram? Yeah, algorithm. Put out legit content. Put out stuff that's good that people engage with. You'll still win. And don't ask people to turn on posts, post notifications. Have people like your stuff. But I mean, really, so you can time when you're putting stuff out. And really, I'll talk about measurement at the end, where you can figure out the best times to be posting specific things and specific content themes. Uh, and as soon as, if I like it, and, and it all depends on when all of my followers are online, right? So I like your photo, and then I can see, you know, you can see what your friends have liked recently and stuff like that. I mean, there's the discover section, which gets a little bit more difficult to get into, but then there's like what your friends have done. Like these people like these photos. But that's really where I'm getting my Instagram recommendations from. I want a friend of mine to have vet this user, vetted this user, then I'm gonna follow them, right? I mean, every once in a while, I'll find a random person that comes up and I'll find them, but 
you want it to be organic or just run a Facebook, like run an ad, run an Instagram ad. Like we want followers. I mean, never run an ad to get likes or followers, even though I just said that. Uh, it's just, it, you end up with like spam bots. Um, put out compelling content. That's the easiest way to get engagement, to get new followers, to get all of that stuff. And go back and see what you put out and see what works. Doug was just telling me that he went from 13 Instagram followers to 1,000 in a week. What up, Doug? Killing it. Uh, but that's because Doug has already seen this presentation before. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm claiming right there. It's just, it was all me. I yelled at you for an hour, and then, and then you were like, cool, I'm going to kill it. Do you have a question? I do have a question. When you were saying, how do you think the algorithm is going to change? Do you think I'm going to Yeah, I mean, I think that it's still going to, the algorithms were going to, as much as they're saying they're testing it out, it's just going to run like Facebooks. So like, if people engage with something, it's going to pop it out there more. If they don't, it's not. Uh, and that's going to go across the board. As much as Instagram's kind of saying that they're coming up with their own or whatever that may be, no. Facebook's been working on this algorithm for like three years, and they own Instagram. They're just going to be like, hey, Here's, here's, the same, here's the same algorithm. Uh, that's what I would assume. Now, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> like, I've read the same stuff that everybody else that's read anything about Instagram has read. Are you just talking about the social mm -hmm. Are you crushing them out? Okay. Have you been crushing them out, like a million of them? Or like a couple? Yeah? So you can prove me wrong. It's totally legit. I'll admit it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, you have to be careful too with that because there are tools like Instagress, which you can go out and it will auto like any words that you put in there. So before I started the DMZ, the DMZ has like 3,500 Instagram followers, but like about a thousand of them are fake because the person before me was running Instagress, which was auto liking about a hundred different words on Instagram. So if somebody hashtagged the word app, the DMZ would like your photo. Like we didn't follow them or anything, but then all those like rando people that were hashtagging a million things ended up following us back. But they're not engaging with us and they don't care. Um, and that's, that's a, yeah, no, I'm not trying to, I'm not arguing, I'm just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, there is that balance. And my thing is always like, I'd rather have legit engaged followers uh, and have like, I, I'd rather have less, just as long as they're engaged. All right, LinkedIn, be there, you're a business. Have you ever clicked on somebody's pro, uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn account that has, that they worked at freelance? Everybody's got one friend that put like, don't, don't, it's totally fine to say like freelance writer as your title, but at the place that you worked, when you write freelance, have you ever clicked that? Shows you all the other dummies that linked freelance, because freelance isn't a company. It's just, it's a position. If you don't, if there's no Facebook, or if there's no LinkedIn page for the actual company, then it just shows all the other idiots that listed that too. So think about it from this perspective of like an investor or a potential partner or a client or whatever, and they add you on Facebook, or sorry, LinkedIn, that's what we're talking about right now. They add you on LinkedIn, and then they click on your company profile, and it just shows you and your co-founder in a list. It doesn't say what your company does, it doesn't provide a website, there's nothing there. Well, what's the perception of that, right? It's, the, you, you, don't, you don't have your stuff together. Uh, don't post a LinkedIn a ton. That's the other rule. All right, Google Plus and YouTube. Everybody's like, why? Because uh, it's Google and they run the internet. You want to be friends with Google. Uh, Google Plus pages are the reason that you show up on Google Maps. You know when you're searching for a restaurant and on the right hand side it shows you like the hours that they're open and the photos that have been taken there and all the reviews? That's Google Plus. You know when you go into Google Calendar and you type in an address and that actually like that place actually shows up that's Google Maps 
or Google Maps. That's Google Plus, which is Google Maps, which is all the things, right? So having a Google, I'm not saying you need to post to Google Plus on a regular basis, but definitely having a, especially if you're brick and mortar, having a presence there helps. So what you do with the Google Plus page, now the negatives of Google Plus, it's a graveyard. Techies are there, kind of, sometimes. Uh, the, the other side to Google Plus is YouTube. YouTube is also owned by Google. Even if you're never going to create a video ever in your entire life, link your YouTube channel to your Google Plus page so you have a brand that is seamlessly again across both of those things. You can create a YouTube page that's linked to a, a Google Plus page. It's just like Facebook, how you have like your personal profile and then you create a page profile and then you link it to a YouTube account. All of the synergies. Uh, now, why you do this, brand out the entire YouTube channel and then it allows you to put in all of your social media channels and your website. These are all positive link backs that are being indexed by Google. So when you go to somebody's YouTube page and it has their website and then Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, all of the things all the way along, Google is indexing all of those and that's how they nest them in a Google, like in a Google search. So when you search and you see a website, then their Facebook page, then Twitter, then Google+, then LinkedIn, then Pinterest, then all the things, that, super easy. All right, the rest, I'm not going to talk about all of them. You guys thought I was going to go through every single one, right? That would be insanity. Pinterest, I will say this. Pinterest is 85% women. If you're selling to women, you probably want to be on Pinterest. And you probably want to have a blog so that you can pin the images from your blog. Pinterest drives the fourth most web traffic that exists. So if you pin, if you create a pin from a blog post, onto a, a board and you have a, a bunch of followers and one of them repins it and they repin it and they repin it. Every time they click that image, it opens and then they can click it again and it leads them to your website where they drink your Kool-Aid and then they give you the monies. All right. Uh, Snapchat, really difficult. I mean, it's not really difficult, but you have to make it compelling content. You're making a movie every day, every other day. I mean. Everyone has friends, like you're on there from your personal account or whatever, and that's fine. But nobody's really making a movie every day other than like Casey Neistat when he was using it all the time. Uh, love Casey Neistat, go check him out. Um, so make sure if you're doing it from a brand, you know what you're doing and you can maintain consistent content. Uh, what else? Tumblr? Uh, are you artsy or do you want 12 year olds? Tumblr. Um, <laughs> that sounds bad. Uh, Re Reddit is really great if you're trying to build an app or build a community around whatever you're building, but you have to jump in real early and spend a ton of time there. Um, there's a DMZ company that was, they built the Next keyboard for iPhone, which like, it's, it's pretty cool, I guess. I don't know. Um, and they did a Kickstarter for it and they, did 15,000, they only asked for $15,000. They raised it in like an hour and a half because a year before that, they started talking about, hey, what would everybody want in an iOS keyboard on Reddit? And then they built a huge following and then all they did was post on Reddit, yo, we're gonna build this keyboard now. You guys ready? $15,000, like an hour. It was insanity. Uh, Periscope and Meerkat, they're real time if you're gonna, like live video or something, but make sure you know what you're doing and that you're not going to swear into a camera. Uh, brand perception. <laughs> so next big thing, it could be anything, right? The social media platforms come out of nowhere. Where am I? 29. Oh my god, hour and a half. Okay, this goes till nine, right? Make sure to keep, uh, make sure to fully brand out each social channel so that you have imagery, all of the things. Aim for the same usernames on Twitter and Instagram because people are lazy and people share from Instagram to Twitter and then they won't tag your brand anymore. Twitter and Instagram, same username because if I share my Instagram post that tags your brand in it to Twitter, I'm gonna tag your brand over there and I, ha I personally have more followers on Twitter than I do on Instagram. Uh, so make sure you have the same name. I mean, you don't have to, but it makes sense, right? It's easier to find your brand across multiple channels too. Uh, I already talked about that. If you're brick and mortar, look at third-party sites um, for location data like Yelp, Foursquare. Nobody uses Foursquare, but a ton of app developers use the Foursquare API 
to pull location data. So Instagram, you know when you, well they used to, now they use Facebook data, but Instagram uses Foursquare data, or they used to, to, to actually pull your location. So you know when you go to tag where you are, that's, that used to come from Instagram, or from Foursquare, and now it comes from Facebook. Same with like on Twitter, if you log into a, like a location, Foursquare, right? So like a bunch of app developers on a regular basis are using the Foursquare API to do location. Um, all right, execution, here we go. Building your social channel. Make sure you do not have an egg. For the love of God, don't have an egg. Because immediate perception is, you don't know what you're doing, and I'm not going to follow you. Like, that's just, that's just what it is, right? Every time I hit this, this page, your, your, your Twitter account here, right, every single thing matters. Are you stalkable? Like, is your actual name, not your handle, your handle can vary, but the actual name that you put at the top, is it the exact same as your actual brand name? Because that's important, because otherwise if I search your brand, it's not going to come up, right? Uh, same with like personal accounts, make sure you have your full name. It's easy to stalk people that way. Thank you. Um, description, actually talk about what you're into, what you do, and how you're going to provide value. Just put all those things together into one little package that's 160 characters, because that's what you get for a, a Twitter description. Roll it out there. Feel free to put in a couple hashtags if you want. Not all at the end, like a spammy weirdo. Don't do that. Uh, don't overfollow. Don't follow 2,000 people and have 20 people follow you. Brand perception, right? You got to keep it even. Don't follow one person and have 500 followers. That's a very Kanye thing to do. And everybody knows what everybody thinks about Kanye. Like good music and other things that I'm not going to swear into the camera again. Uh, okay. So, following follower ratio, your private lists, go in and set them up. Right? Just come up with a couple to start, like competition. You probably know who they are. Go and set those up. Private list, add them to it. You just click the gear icon beside somebody's profile and then add them to that list so that you can monitor those people on a regular basis. Because Twitter is a fire hose. It's ridiculous. There's so much content coming out. You don't have to look at all of it. Break it all down into lists and then go in and engage with specific lists at specific times. It makes it so much easier to deal with. Facebook, don't make a personal account for your brand. If your brand tries to add me as a friend, I hate you. Uh, I know I've said that a lot, but this one's really true. Um, right? You can monitor competition through the Facebook Insights. Uh, make sure you have, you can actually install tabs that show your other social media platforms like Instagram and Twitter. That'll show up right in Facebook. Make sure you fully brand out your channel. Um, what else? Oh, your username. Facebook.com slash, hopefully, your domain, right? If you have Facebook.com slash whatever name dash a bunch of numbers, no, that's bad. Go to Facebook.com slash username, and it'll be like, what username do you want for your Facebook page? And that's where you claim it, uh, and it helps with your SEO. What not to do? Do not cross the streams. Don't share from Instagram to Twitter. Don't share from Twitter to Facebook. Don't, 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 just don't be lazy. Because all this really says is like, I am too lazy to actually post this again. Right? Now, every once in a while, you can share from Instagram to Twitter so that people know that you have an Instagram account. And that's fine, I guess. Uh, but just, just don't. It looks bad. When you share from Instagram to Twitter, a link just shows up. It just says Instagram.com. Now, so now I'm like following you on Twitter and I see this thing and I click it. Well, that's one click right there. And then my phone, because I have an Android and I'm better than you if you have an iPhone. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Doug. Tell this guy. He can hook you up with iPhones afterwards, right? Sweet. All right. <laughs> so then it asked me if I want to open this photo in Instagram. This is my second click. This better be the best photo I have ever seen in my entire life. And then I get through to it and it's like, here I'm on a Sunday morning with a coffee and your laptop and I'm like, oh my God. So don't cross the streams. Don't share your, your tweets to Facebook. Because when people on Facebook, well, when older people on Facebook see your hashtags, it confuses them. <laughs> Plus, 
don't use don't use hashtags on Facebook. Just don't do just don't do it. When's the last time you clicked one on Facebook? Oh, never? Cool. Great. All right. When to post? Burrito principle. This is when you could eat a burrito. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to post at this time. I've given this talk a bunch, so I assume a bunch of people post at these times. It's all about measuring your own demographic and figuring out when they post, right? Like measuring your posts that go out, what posts are you putting out at what certain times, and what's getting engagement. Burrito principle is where you can start, right? Morning commute, breakfast burrito. Lunch, burrito. Evening commute, burrito. After dinner, laying in bed, Look at a Facebook, eating a burrito. It's basically when you could eat a burrito. When do you feel like eating a burrito? All those times? Sometimes. Uh, there are other things out there like infomercial effect, which is basically like sharing at 2 AM because nobody else is sharing. And potentially you capture those people that are online, but obviously less people are online. Um, but always be measuring and adapting. And I'll talk about how we measure at the, the end of this. Uh, a few rough guidelines of when or how often to post. Don't tweet like a crazy person, please. Don't tweet 17 times in an hour and then never tweet again for four days. Space it out. So with the DMZ, I tweet four times a day unless I'm doing a real-time event or something happens and my boss is like, we have to promote this now and then I just kind of break with it, right? None of these rules are like super hard or defined. They're you know, you're going to break them. I break these, all these things that I'm telling you to do, I break them all the time. But like, it's just a rough guideline to kind of drive it, right? So no more than four times a day. I try and tweet like three hours in between because first perception when you land on my Twitter account is not, oh, they've tweeted 17 times in the last hour. Why would you ever follow a Twitter account that did that? Because then you're thinking, oh God, I don't want to see 17 tweets in an hour from this one account. Same with like, and content themes. This is why you have to vary your content themes and put out different content on a regular basis. Because first perception, when I land on a Twitter account or a Facebook page, what are the last three things that you shared? That's your brand to me, right? So if you have, come to this event, come to this event, come to this event, that's your brand. That's your brand to me. And that's not really what you want. You want to showcase different things that you're going to be talking about on a regular basis so that people find that engaging. Facebook no more than two times a day. When I started the DMZ, I was posting two times a day, and then I realized that I, my unlikes were spiking every time I posted two times a day, so I stopped, and now I only post once a day. Uh, still within like burrito principle timelines, it's either like 8 o'clock in the morning, noon, 4.30, 8.30, and I'm always varying. I'm never like putting like 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, all the way, all the week, like for the entire week. It's like 7.20, 8.10. 755, so that every day it's a little bit different. And I'm not sharing the same content theme at the same time, back to back to back to back to back days. Because that's why I don't believe in like content calendars and stuff like that. I know that I'm not really talking about that right now. But like building out what you're going to talk about for the next month is crazy. You have no idea what's going to happen. So like I'll schedule for maybe two or three days. I use Hootsuite to schedule. You can use Buffer. There's TweetDeck. I have a, a slide for all of this at the end. But like you can schedule stuff out. Uh, LinkedIn, no more than two or three times a day, or two or three times a week, sorry. Not two or three times a day. Don't be that guy, right? Basically, don't be your friend that shares every single thought that they've ever had in their brain and then they write it on Facebook. Everybody has one of those friends where it's like, oh, I just woke up, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm eating breakfast, now I'm walking, now I'm at work. Like, and then you're like, oh my God, I can't be friends with this person anymore. If your brand is doing that, it's even worse. Uh, constant content is super important, right? Be sharing stuff on a regular basis, whatever you can maintain. If it's once every two days, cool, and it's once every two days, right? If it's one tweet a day, that's fine too. But like, come up with a consistent calendar because like with the Facebook algorithm, if you post today and tomorrow and the next day and then you don't post for two weeks, that's no time for anybody to engage with anything that you put out. So then when you go to post your next thing, Facebook goes, oh, no one's engaged with them in the last two weeks, and they share your post to no one. I mean, it'll be like seven people or something like that. Uh, what makes people share? Inspiration, humor, identity, nostalgia. 
value timing. This is what people will share, right? If I identify with something, or if I find that it provides value, and timing's kind of like not just timing, but you have to put all these things out at the right time, which is when I'm online, right? And you have to provide value to me through any of those things. And I stole those from the BuzzFeed CMO, and he seems to know what he's talking about. Uh, but that's what people will share, right? That's why people will share content they haven't even read before, because they identify with it, or they want people to identify them with it, right? That's, that's, what you're try that, that's always what you're trying to share. So here are two examples randomly. Uh, where I get actual content from. So a lot of the stuff that I put out is either secondary content or it's coming from somewhere else. But I take it from everywhere. Uh, Google Alerts, Pinterest, BuzzSumo, RSS, competitors. I'll pull a link that a competitor has shared and I'll be like, I can write that tweet better. And then I put it in a two post doc and I, I have like a Google document that I share with my assistant. And we just have all of our content themes broken down. And then anytime we, sh we find an article, we just post that link in there. And then later on when I'm going to schedule, I hammer them all out, right? And that way I can take from each of my content themes and schedule them out accordingly. Uh, plus, uh, I do social media channels for like the DMZ startups because they're all terrible at sharing their news with the DMZ so that we can share it to our 25,000 followers. Uh, if you ever get into the DMZ, tell me about your news. Maya does. She does. She's like the only entrepreneur in the entire space that's like, hey, I'm on TV. Uh, <laughs> so I monitor every single startup, and every single day I go through everything they tweeted in the last 24 hours to find interesting content, hopefully. And the last way to get social or to get content is to create it, which is time consuming. So here's a tweet. <sighs> Real estate is an industry ripe for disruption. Here are three Toronto startups changing the game. Inline image, this is what shows up on Twitter, uh, unless you're on mobile. And then this expanded version shows up. These are Twitter cards. This is a Twitter card. This is why Twitter cards are important. Because then, see this pretty picture with the title that you can't read because I took a really blurry, blurry screenshot of this tweet? Cool. Um, that, that's, what, that's what you want. Now, what have I done here? Strategic hashtags, no more than three, but not always three. Uh, what I did hashtag was subject, location, and brand personality. There is no brand personality in this one, but you can throw it on the end. If you want to hashtag bomb diggity, because that's legit and it like goes with your brand, that's totally fine. Do it. I mean, and really, when you're writing these things, write like a human. Uh, just if you would say bomb diggity, hashtag it. I would. Um, <laughs> okay, so. The hashtags are actually, so I have subject, location, brand, personality, and I know you're like, but Brent, Toronto is there, and you didn't hashtag it. You're keen. Nice. Uh, I don't hashtag every single time I bring up Toronto or startups or any of that stuff because, again, initial perception when you land on my Twitter account is if, if, you, if I hashtag every time I said Toronto or startups, every single post I had, What's going to jump out at you? The hashtags, and they're all going to say like Toronto startups, Toronto startups, Toronto startups. And I don't want people to think that that's all I'm talking about, even though for the most part, it is, because uh, it's an incubator for startups in Toronto. Uh, <laughs> okay. So hashtags are added in the copy, not tacked on the end. I absolutely hate. I met with a uh, with a student the other day that I lectured her class, and she had a a company. Uh, that sold bow ties and I looked at her social media feed and she put out in all caps pocket squares and then underneath hashtag pocket squares <laughs> you just made me read pocket squares twice why why would you I hate when people do that that's like with this tweet me reading writing real estate and then at the end hashtagging real estate which basically says, I'm here to waste your time, right? Like, that's, it's super important. Like, just hashtag it in there. And at the same time, if you look at it from a design perspective, your eyes are drawn to the blue. Real estate, startups, link. That's what this tweet is about. 
That's all you really need to know. If you don't want to read about real estate startups, move on. Totally cool. Didn't waste your time. Right? I'm drawing you to the two major things that this is talking about. Uh, burrito principle, I shared it at 1150. The reason you share before noon is that that's when people go for lunch. So you're like looking through Twitter and you're looking through Twitter and you like stand in line at like a healthy place, not Harvey's like I had today, but that's how I roll. Um, and I'm standing in line at Harvey's and I'm looking on Twitter and I'm looking on Twitter. And then by the time I sit down, it's probably around like 1150, 1130, 1110 maybe. So like sharing before noon makes sense because that's when I'm going to hit an article and read it. And every time I click that thing, you gain brand loyalty from me, right? If I click your link, then I'm like, wow, these guys share cool content. Unless I hate it, when I, like, unless it's like not a responsive website or whatever, uh, I don't know. You know what I mean. Uh, link shortened for tracking and analytics. It's a compelling tweet that draws the user in. This is subjective, because I wrote it. Uh, but I think it's cool, right? Um, <laughs> there we go. So here are another couple of examples. Uh, of different things that I have shared. Like I jumped May the 4th, be with you, and we like shared, we, we were watching Star Wars, so that's cool, because that's like brand personality. You're like, well, is super cool, I'd love to work there, maybe I should apply. I'm like, oh, cool, I just achieved my goal. Um, right here when I'm talking about this DMZ talk, so I do Twitter talks on a regular basis, and I've tagged a bunch of people in this photo. Those are my experts that I had already emailed, asked to be part of the tw Twitter talk, they said yes, and then I tagged them in the photo. I did not randomly tag them in hopes that they would retweet it. I get this all the time for the DMZ. Oh my God, if I don't know who you are, and we haven't come to a co-promotional agreement, and you tag me in a tweet because you think I'm gonna retweet it, You've actually just done the opposite, and now I never want to deal with you again. The DMZ gets mentioned like 400 times every two weeks, and when random people think, oh, the DMZ will just retweet this if I, if I tag them in it. Nah, because you're not providing value to my community, right? And there are a lot of people that will retweet that stuff for sure, but what you've actually done to me is piss me off now, and now I don't want to deal with you. And I've actually shut down different companies that try and come in afterwards and they're like, we'd love to do a co-promotional deal. And I'm like, no, nah, because you've just been spamming nine other people in these photos that also hate you now, right? Always provide value, always be authentic. I absolutely hate when people do that. Who's my hated person this week? It's like the Law Society of, of Ryerson. If you know somebody, they keep tagging me on Instagram, stop it. Uh, okay, do not, see this list is way longer, <laughs> do not retweet braggadocious mentions. Braggadocious isn't a word, but I like using it, it's cool. Uh, so when you retweet a braggadocious mention, that's the equivalent of mine being like, Brent, that was the best social media talk I've ever heard, and I just turn and go, yo, did you guys hear what she just said? That's a retweet of a braggadocious mention, instead of saying, Oh, thanks, Mayan. That's super cool that you said that. Why wouldn't I just reply to Mayan? Opposed to retweeting ridiculousness to my followers, and now my followers go, okay, I'm already following you. So they've already deemed me cool enough to follow me. Why do they need to know that I'm awesome? Again, from somebody else. That's ridiculous. Uh, no. I would retweet it if it provided value. Right. Like, if you quote something that I say that I hopefully agree with, <laughs> and it's not ridiculous, like it's not like, Brent Retainer says, uh, um, the social medias, uh, then I won't retweet that, but like, if it's something of value to my followers, and generally I'd quote tweet it on top, right? Like, I'm gonna say something along those lines that's hopefully compelling or funny. Does that make sense? I reply to everybody, always reply. Unless it's like somebody going absolutely crazy bonkers nuts, then like, boo, back away. Uh, but I try and reply to everybody uh, from every brand that I have. Um, don't retweet every mention of your brand. Don't share my best retweets of the week. Nobody cares. No one cares. Zero people care. I don't care who retweeted you. 
I don't care who your most engaged followers were either. I don't, I don't care. Uh, send them a DM and be like, hey, thanks so much. That's cool. Um, don't tweet your Instagram or Facebook posts. We talked about this. Don't tag users in copies you, in copy you hope will retweet. I also talked about this. Don't share photos that are portrait. Inline imagery is on mobile, it's 1200 by 1200, but on desktop, it's 1200 by 630 on Twitter. So when you take a portrait photo, and same with on Facebook, just always take landscape photos. When you take a portrait photo of me, this shows up. You see this with politicians all the time, where it, this shows up, it's just, it's just crotches of politicians. And they're like, great to be at this place. Um, and then you have to expand, you have to click to see, to see the rest. That's ridiculous, just turn your phone and take a picture, uh, unless you're like, screenshotting your own Snapchat and then you're sharing that, but then you're weird. Uh, okay, ask people to like or follow you on other social media channels. I'm already following you on this one, be happy about that. Uh, unless you're launching a new one, we're now on Instagram. Uh, use the same word in a tweet if you can help it because it's only 140 characters, you're better than that. Uh, tweet the same thing over and over again and don't start a tweet with a username if you want people to see it. If you write at Brentertainer, hey, how's it going? Only the people that follow both you and I see that. That's why people put periods in front. Now, if you want to just send me a message that probably no one will see, at Brentertainer. Hey, that was the most terrible talk I've ever seen. Cool. Thanks, homie. Uh, do you want me to stop so they can do that? Okay. All right. Tweet checklist. If you download these slides, just go through this every time you go to tweet, all right? Just like tacking on a wall or something, I don't know. I send this, I, I literally built this because I sent it to a bunch of people that work at the DMZ. I just was like, hey, every time you tweet now, I need you to, I need you to go through these steps. Because uh, BD people are not very good at, <laughs> at Twitter. Uh, um, they are now. You can't read any of these things, I've realized, cool. Uh, this says, uh, Tariq Fancy of the Rumi Initiative on the importance of the DMZ community of entrepreneurs. Uh, so this is like Facebook and LinkedIn, right? 1200 by 1200 is that image. I actually tagged the Rumi Initiative. You can just at and then that company and then their social media person gets a notification so that they can like it, engage with it, share it, any of those things. And there's a potential through the Facebook algorithm that when you're tagging brands, that you show up in those, so say I tag the Rumi initiative here, or I have, there's a potential that this po post shows up in people who have liked the Rumi initiative's pages newsfeed. Very slim potential, but it still exists, and why not, right? Uh, real estate, and here's my tweet, exactly the same, except no hashtags, because, don't confuse the olds, don't do it. Uh, now you'll notice that it is not the same as the actual title of the article, because you shouldn't ever do that on Facebook, because then you're just making people read the same sentence twice. So here's a breakdown. This says, uh, we asked 10 entrepreneurs in the DMZ to finish this sentence. The one thing nobody told me about being an entrepreneur, in gifts. Then I selected Michelle from Full House. As our, as our image, and you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Why would Michelle be in a thing about entrepreneurs? Thank you, that's exactly what I want you to ask, so that you click it. Look what I just did. Super cool, right? Okay, so, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the power of what you can do with all of this, but it reads like multiple sentences, right? And it's compelling, you're interested, you're like, what is going on? and you need to know why Michelle is there. What could this gift be that Michelle is doing? I mean, that's what I hope anyway, right? Uh, my copy is not a full paragraph because nobody's reading that much. It's the internet. Um, full width article image, 1200 by 628. Oh, notice that I have taken the URL out so that you don't actually see that blue hyperlink that makes it look weird. Just remove it. Just let it, let it embed. Just give it a second and then pull the URL out because it looks gross. What are you doing? <laughs> um, all right, full lead, open graph enabled, tagging irrelevant brands, no hashtags unless it's for brand personality or for an event. Boom. So there's a hashtag here, even though I've been railing on no hashtags. This 
was because we had Uber bring in, they had like Uber puppies or something where you could order puppies to your office and it was really, really difficult to get them. But we were trying to sign a deal with Uber at the time, which we have maybe since signed. We're definitely in talks. Anyway, uh, this is sort of like BD from that, that perspective, right? In that I tagged Uber in this. Now, I mean, did their social media person tell their Canadian business development team that we tagged them? I don't know. But if they look at our Facebook page, they see a tag of Uber. Uh, this is a solid stop to all entrepreneurial work in the DMZ, thanks to Uber and Save Our Scruff, who was bringing the dogs around. Uh, and then hashtag Uber 3 million dogs, because it was trending on Twitter, and I was trying to like support that event and show that the DMZ has cool stuff going on. Um, what not to post? So I have this post up here because when I went to embed this link for this guy who's uh, Dr Dr Dries Buterit, I have no idea how to say his last name. He's the, um, oh god, now I'm blanking. Drupal? Yeah, he made Drupal. I don't know if you're a dev or not, but he made Drupal. So we had him in to talk. Uh, when I went to embed this link, no image showed up. The title was Acquia. And then the lead to it was just a star underneath. That's gross. No open graph. That sucks. Uh, so I had to rewrite that. From a page, you can rewrite links. You can like change them and everything like that. From a personal account, you can't. So if anybody shared that, terrible. So don't post with usernames. Don't hashtag like a crazy person. Just don't hashtag in anything on like LinkedIn. Google Plus, you can to a point. Uh, don't share a link and post the title as your copy as well because you don't want to post the same thing twice. Don't share photos that are portrait. This is the same deal with Facebook, right? Facebook and Twitter, but with Facebook, it shrinks it. On mobile, it looks fine. On desktop, it shrinks it and there's like that weird white space because like your post goes here and then your image is here and you're like, what the f Don't do that. Uh, don't share links that do not contain a properly formatted title, image, and lead. When you share something, even if somebody's open graph is messed up, it's on you as the brand page to make it look better. I change images on a regular basis and swap in an image that I know will resonate better with my demographics uh, than whatever the Globe and Mail has selected. Right? Don't ask for likes. Don't share the same post over and over again. Did I get them all? Don't share or don't tag users and copy that you hope will share. Post checklist. Oh, and basically my tweet checklist is my Instagram checklist. Do the same thing. You can just write a little bit longer if you want, right? So things to keep in mind. Try not to use the same content theme twice in a row. I already talked about that. Always provide value. Just always keep that in mind. Um, never spam out your feeds. Don't share mobile links. You know how some newspapers still have m dot whatever when you're viewing it on mobile and then you share it to Twitter? Well, now I'm clicking that m dot whatever link on my desktop and it explodes and the letters are this big and I'm like, what is going on? Just find the original link for it. Number five, it should be number one. Ask yourself, would I retweet, like, share or engage with this content if I saw it from a person I do not know, from a brand you don't know. Because if you wouldn't engage with it, if you saw it randomly out there, why would you expect anyone else to? Right? Really what it comes down to is you are your target demographic, to a point. Unless you're doing like elderly care products and you're like a young person. But like, think about what you do yourself and how you would engage or react to the post that you're putting out there. Strike a maintainable balance between primary and secondary content. That means if you can only blog twice a month, then don't put your two blogs two days apart. Put them two weeks apart. Jab, 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 right hook. Very good book. Also give, 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 ask, right? Always. If you can provide value, provide value, provide value, provide value, ask for something, then people are far more likely to do that thing. Uh, engage, 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 always, always engage. Run a bunch of lists, even, I, I kind of forgot to talk about this, but from a BD pipeline perspective, I do this all the time, our business development team, I send them every single new follower that we get that I think is of interest to them. I even send them, I send our startup services a whole list of new followers that we get every week too, so that we can recruit from our Twitter list. It, just in case you follow, even if you only have four followers, as long as you have a fully branded out 
Twitter channel, I'm going to look at your account, and then I'm going to judge you, and then maybe I'm going to send you to my startup services team, and then they're going to look at your website, and then they're going to reach out to you to attempt to recruit you to apply to the DMZ, where we're going to help your business grow for free. Uh, so there's that, which is weird. And our business development team, I sit in on their meetings every week about our prospects, who we're talking to, and then I go and do the exact same thing that I was talking about with the Tridel thing for those companies. I add them all in a private list of BD prospects. Then once we have them in for a meeting, I move them into BD Current. And then once we actually sign a partnership with them, I move them into partnerships. So I have a total Twitter funnel of our entire business development too. And they're running their own private lists uh, so that they can engage with those people. Sorry, that was kind of off topic, but I forgot to bring it up, so I figured I would now. Don't write like a 12-year-old. Just don't. Nothing ever in the history of time is GR8. Nothing. Zero things are GR8 ever. Never write that. Never. If you're going to the net, no. No. Write it better. Just stop, delete everything, write it again. It looks so bad. Uh, here are a couple short forms that I will accept. <laughs> Not that I'm going to judge you or anything, but that's, those are the ones that I use. Uh, Tweet and post like a human. Just, just, if you wouldn't say it in real life, don't tweet it. Just, if, if you would have that conversation with someone in real life, tweet that, post that, whatever. Just, I, there's this disconnect between like people's brains and what they say that comes out of their mouth, and then they go and sit down at a keyboard, and then they, they don't write those things. Just say it out loud then write it down. I mean, the, the reason that I'm decent at social is because I talk like this 100% of the time, and this is how I do things on social, but it's less ranty because you can't tell tone, and I don't swear on social. Uh, so that's why it works, right? Be a little bit ridiculous. Um, you don't have to be this ridiculous. I'm, uh, I'm an HR nightmare waiting to happen. Uh, <laughs> I keep forgetting that that's there. <laughs> um, and you are your target demographic, right? Management, these are a bunch of things you can use to manage social media channels. Uh, I use Hootsuite, I pay them $10 a month. Uh, because I'm coming from, like I came from building my own business and having to spend my own money anytime I spent money on anything, uh, all of these things are free for the most part. Uh, Sprout Social costs a little bit, it's like 50 bucks, which is, that's expensive for social, even for me. Hootsuite, Buffer, TweetDeck, Sprout Social. Twitter analytics are awesome. Go in, look at them. They'll tell you all the things. Uh, Facebook Insights, Google Analytics. Uh, management tools, unfollowers.com. They recently rebranded re to statusbrew.com. I just have failed to update my slides, I apologize. This tells me every single person that unfollowed me in the last week. And I get an email every week. So when you unfollow me, guess what? I'm unfollowing you too. Um, <laughs> okay, but it also allows me to go through and see who I am following that hasn't tweeted for the last three months. Uh, and it gives me a full breakdown of like how many followers those people have when the last time they've tweeted is, what their description is, what their location is, which you cannot get by clicking followers on Twitter. Uh, TweetBinder is hashtag analytics. They do up to 1,500 tweets for free, but Twitter recently like flipped their API, so that's kind of messing around. I pay them now. It's like 20 bucks for a report. Uh, push bullet, phone to Chrome. Everything that happens on my phone shows up on my laptop. It makes my life so much easier because I have like seven Twitter accounts, and that gets insanity really quickly. Uh, it's a really good one. You can even like text back to people through your, and I have it set up on multiple laptops, so I just sit down and my whole phone shows up there. It's cool. Uh, Twitter app. Need to have the mobile apps. To be responsive to anything, you need to have the mobile apps, you need to have Twitter on your phone, and you need to have Facebook Pages Manager, and you need to go in and change your notification settings so that you actually get all of your notifications. Twitter defaults to tailored for you, which means Twitter is going to decide which, which tweets you see. It also syncs every, I think, six hours or something. I have mine syncing every five minutes. Uh, so that's cool and important. 
Make sure that you get, if somebody tweets you, you're going to get that notification. Turn off tailored for you and put on from everyone. Because what happens if I tweet at you like, hey, I just found a million dollars and I'd like to give it to your company, but you're not following me, you don't have anybody that's relevant that's following me, but like I'm a VC and I've been stocking your company and I see that you went to Brent's lecture and now you're really good at the socials. That's, that's braggadocious, uh, <laughs> right? You just want to be able to engage with everybody. Uh, Facebook Pages app, same deal. Change the notification settings, make sure that they're on so that if somebody messages your page, Facebook is even more so because if you can respond in five minutes, it gives you like this badge on your Facebook page that says you're super responsive so that all of your followers or anybody that comes to your page goes, wow, these guys are paying attention. If you can respond in five minutes to anybody, their initial reaction is always going to say like, wow, thanks for the super quick reply. Every single time. You know when you tweet at a brand and then you wait for like 17 hours? Looking at you, tell us. Uh, I'm just messing with you. Um, <laughs> but when you like wait for 17 hours and then they reply, you hate them so much by that point. The other night I like rage tweeted at Best Buy. I had to delete it because I had to do a talk the next morning and I knew somebody would look at my Twitter account. But I rage tweeted them and they didn't respond for three hours. Like I tweeted at their help thing and Best Buy Canada, three hours? And now I'm in front of all of you being like, hey, guess what, I hate Best Buy. Like they should have responded, right? And I did that even at the Toronto Region Board of Trade when I spoke to them. So like, I'm really just hammering it to Best Buy because they didn't respond to me on social. Um, Bitly for creating links that can be a call to action. Anytime I'm doing an event, I actually create, if you saw on the, the Twitter talk one, I always do DMZ talks, which is my hashtag, then the date as the link so that I don't have to put the date into my tweet. I'm actually saving characters that way. So I can say like this Thursday and the, the link is like DM, bit.ly slash DMZ talks, Mar what's March, whatever. Do not use the generic bit.ly. Yeah, generic bit.ly just is ridiculous. I agree, Doug. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, generic bit.ly looks weird and it's, it's strange because now I know you're tracking me, but what are you tracking me for? Owly's cool, that's through Hootsuite. People seem to be less weary of that, I guess. But even then, right, I generally want to know where I'm going. Uh, Pablo for buffer, if you don't know anything about graphic design, Pablo is a buffer thing, like buffer created Pablo, so you can just put text over top of images and they're perfectly sized for social, so that's cool. Private Twitter lists, I've talked a bunch about this. Create them, use them, love them. Uh, so I have a Google Doc that has all of my content that I'm gonna push out in it, and Hootsuite, this is one of my tabs. It has current startups, alumni startups, every single, I'm, ser I'm doing searches for every iteration of the DMZ you could possibly think of, mentions, uh, and then what's that, DMZ members, which are people that work out of there. Then I have a whole other list of tabs that are searching for my executive director's name, his Twitter account. Uh, I get mobile notifications anytime anyone that works for the DMZ tweets. Uh, so between Pushbullet and Hootsuite, Hootsuite you can see what you've scheduled out. I schedule natively for Facebook because then you can tag other brands and then I just take that scheduling and put it out to Google Plus in Hootsuite so that I can see Twitter who, and, and Google Plus there so that I can look at my Hootsuite and see what's gonna go out to Facebook. And then I schedule my LinkedIn as well through Hootsuite. Okay, measurement. Okay, everybody will be like, oh, the, so I use, I use Hootsuite analytics to get those like baseline metrics that kind of just show me and it's like you pay the 10 bucks, you get 50 points, you build a report and like, it does a good job of visualizing it and I can send them to my manager and my manager goes, oh, I love the graphs. Uh, but how I actually measure is way more complicated than that. Um, and CrowdBabel, my friends there, are going to build this solution for me because I told them this is how I measure and they were like, what? Uh, so what I do is I have a document that's called Tweets That Sucked. Um, and it is an Excel spreadsheet. Because social isn't just the numbers, it's the creative too, right? Uh, so I get my assistant, she hates it, God bless her soul, um, to go through all of our analytics every month 
and pull the worst three indexing tweets, the worst three Facebook posts, and the worst three LinkedIn posts. And then she puts in, so all the way across, it's like when we shared it, meaning the date, the day, the time, then the creative that went with it, is it an image, is it a link, is it what, what was that? Then the content theme that it was, and then all of the, all the numbers. Then I can I get her to compare it to the week before and the week after in the same time slot so that I can see, is it that time of day? Is it that day? Is it that content theme? Or is the creative terrible, right? Is my copy terrible? Because sometimes the copy is terrible, and that's all it is. Uh, but I do that for all the tweets that sucked, so top three tweets that sucked compared to the week before and the week after in the same time slot. The top three posts on LinkedIn that sucked, or the worst three, I guess. And same with Facebook posts that sucked. And then I do the reverse, where I go through and I look at Facebook posts that rocked, tweets that rocked, LinkedIn posts that rocked. And I compare all of those, and I do week before and the week after to see is it the content theme, the time, and that's how I assess my content themes. And after, over time, if I see a trend, so I have multiple sheets on an Excel, it's Google, Excel, whatever that is. Uh, if I see, and then I write all of my like, findings at the bottom, where I'm like, this content theme under-indexed, this one over-indexed, this time looks to be strange, and then I go into the next month, right? And I do that. And if I see the same trends month over month, then I realize, okay, I need to be posting at a different time. Uh, last year, right around this time, I guess it was April, Facebook, 7.30 p.m. on a Sunday, crushing it all the time, killing it. It was the best. Everything I put out, didn't matter what it was, it was getting the most engagement I got for the entire week. Everybody was liking it and commenting on it and all that stuff. And then right around like April, May-ish, it started to kind of drop off. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And this came up in my like monthly thing. I was like, whoa, 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 why is like post that sucked? Why does it have Sunday at 7.30? This always is the good one. And then I realized it was because it was nice out and it's Sunday and people are walking their dog or they're getting ice cream or they're going for beers or whatever that is. They're not sitting in bed, eating a burrito, looking at Facebook. Right? So like, it doesn't even matter once you've figured out your demographic and like, you're like, these are the times that I can push stuff out at that really kills it because it changes. Right? Everybody's doing different things all the way throughout, throughout the year. Let's put it that way. So look at your engagement, your engagement rate, and impressions, and which content themes are overperforming. Uh, and always guess, test, measure, adapt, rinse, repeat. You don't know. I don't know either. Sometimes I never put anything out at 6.30, but every once in a while I'll be like, psh, like 6.30 p.m. I'm like, eh, why not? And I throw it out there. Because maybe it'll show up in like tweets that rocked. And I'll be like, cool, maybe I should post at 6.30 more often. Or I put something out at 2 o'clock in the morning. Because I don't know. I mean, I have no idea what my demographic is doing. Like, you can, you can do rough breakdowns, but you can't do anything so specific. Like, even your own habits, you're not on Facebook at the exact same time every single day. So you can't, it's so difficult to figure out when the best time to post is and what content is over-indexing or under-indexing. Uh, and you can get crazy numbers if you really want. Like, if you want to show somebody that you're really good at social, you can go out and just, just like, pay five bucks to any kind of random spammy bot, whatever, run an ad. You can get whatever numbers you want. I've had a bunch of clients try and hire me and be like, well, we want to get to 10,000 followers in two months. I'm like, why two months? I could do it tomorrow. The whole point is like, you want legitimate engagement. Uh, so I'd rather have somebody with 50,000 followers, one person follow me, than have 50,000 followers with two people, two followers each follow me. Now I'm not talking about metrics anymore and I'm talking about evangelists. Further reading. Burrito Principle and Beyond, go read that. It has a, a bunch of other different posting times. Uh, the Buffer blog in general is really good. Uh, there are a couple of articles. Jab, 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 right hook. Gary Vaynerchuk, he's like my social media god. Um, and Scott Stratton on marketing. Because like, what? I tweeted the guy and then I met him. That's crazy. Uh, 
Storytelling for Startup, Hooked by Near IL, is actually on building habit-forming products, but it relates very, very well with social. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, these are all the things that I read on a regular basis so that I stay up to date, kind of, sometimes. I don't catch everything. Thanks. Oh, and you can download the slides there. It is case sensitive. And there we go. All right, cool. This is fun. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. Look at you.